everybody. Welcome back to the Who Cares Anyway podcast. We are live and it is a Friday night. And oh shit, did I ever forget to mention we are live? Woo! First live show in like the last three shows. Dear God, I have missed this. Where the hell have we all been? Well, you know, we've been busy. We've been busy with shit. But you know what, guys? I want to start this off by just asking you. How have you guys been? Let us know in the chat. I do see a whole bunch of you guys. The the China Sticks Army is here. It's alive and well. And, yeah, uh, I'm going to throw this to, uh, to everybody else on the panel, starting with uh, Nico, the swabby one himself, Nico Rigoli. Nico, what's up with you, my man? How how, how have you been since our last live show? <laughs> Lots happened since our last live show. We, uh, we went to New York. We talked to Kaiser before that. Um School has started for me. A lot of shit going on there. We talked about yoga quizzes last week. <laughs> um, and uh, I almost had a panic attack when the week started, but got through it, and I'm happy to say I checked off a good portion of the shit that was on my giant to-do list for the week. And now we celebrate our one-year anniversary today. You are goddamn right. Uh and, you know, speaking of, I have, to, I have to throw this to the guy who talked to me out of a little bit of a rut that I was in roughly a year ago and said, uh, hey, Chris, can we, uh, can, we, can, we, can we do something together again? And I was like, ah, fine, if you're going to drag me uh, kicking and screaming the whole time. Case, Cornelius, uh, Case, what's up, man? How, how, how are you doing? I am doing uh, quite well. I don't remember the last time that there was a live show or that I was on it. Uh, <laughs> because I, I've missed a couple, and that is not because of my fault. I was actually available in the last couple of weeks. It was that you guys were doing shit. Uh, but, you know, we're here, we're live, and yeah, uh, we have existed for almost a year. Next next week, the 22nd, will be the official anniversary of our first video. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and uh, last year... I was missing something. I, I wanted to react to the Schmodown again. Um, I wanted to do, well, a YouTube channel with you because we have been pretty good uh, in our YouTube career together, I think. Uh, starting off at Take 3, then shit happened at Take 3 and we needed to do something else. And I was like, you know what, let's start a channel. And here we are, almost a year later. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to the show, looking forward to what we're going to talk about. So it's fun. Damn. Skippy, how about that? One year later, and we haven't we haven't killed each other yet, you know. So, but uh, it, it and yeah, it, it's kind of, one it, year later. That is years later. Uh, fair enough, fair enough. But yeah, no, like here we are, guys. And look, you guys only have yourselves to thank for uh for for helping us get here, for helping us you know get this channel up and running, for helping us uh get to a place where you know. People recognize us. Like, you know, Nico can attest to this. When we were at New York, we got stopped on the street, and somebody actually recognized recognized us. Like, huh. Nice. All right, then. And, and taste, it feels damn good. It does feel damn good. But, uh, you know, we're, we're not here to kiss our own ass all night because there actually is a lot of cool stuff that we want to get into, we want to talk about. And there is some movie news that, uh, I'm you know, we're going to break down a little bit of. But I had to call a little bit of an audible right before we went live because uh, something very important dropped. And we'll get there. In a- it's awesome. Well, for me, it's still only like nine months. Still? Because I, I joined late. <laughs> you did. Well, you joined, and I think you're a very good addition to the channel. So happy exactly. to have you. Yay. Yay. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, yeah, let's... Let's break into some movie news because, like, you know, sure, I could talk about my week and how it's had some highs and lows. You know, uh, go to Multiplex Entertainment if you know if you want to know what I'm talking about there. Uh, <laughs> well, to be fair, N- Nico, you're you're having the exact opposite of a bad week, I- I'd say, in, but in that regard. Uh, in what regard? I missed something you said because I saw that Abe Flores is in the chat. I don't think Abe. I've ever seen him in the chat before, and that kind of threw me off. So, hi, Abe. What was your question again? Hey. hey. <laughs> Uh, no, I was just I was just saying, um, you know, I, I I've I've had a little bit of a rough week, and I think uh, Multiplex Entertainment might uh, be a, a a good a good showing of why that is. But you know, eh, what are you gonna do? And I'm saying that's the exact opposite for you, you know. 
I'm, I'm not going to spoil my match, but I'm just going to say I've had a performance that I can be very proud of. Um, That's good. And again, a week that you can check shit off of your to-do list is always a good week. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You know, but, but to be fair, though, I also can't say I had the worst week because I got, uh, I got to finish watching season two of DuckTales. And my God, uh-huh. my God, this show is just great it's fucking great Ugh. anyway sorry yes enough enough, enough ass kissing of, of uh one of the best kids shows out there today actually best all ages shows so yeah movie news case you happen to have an affinity for a little franchise called mission impossible right uh since three essentially yeah i don't much, don't much care for the first two movies but yeah and that's kind of the consensus of most people. I'm like, I like the first one, but, you know, it's... It, I don't love it as much as I do, like, Ghost Protocol, Rogue Nation, and I, for some reason, I just have not made time to catch Fallout yet. But I will. I will. I will. I promise. I promise. But speaking of this great franchise, what if I told you that uh, Captain America's girlfriend is going to be hopping in as, as a lead role for the next couple of films? You excited for that? Um, I have questions. Okay. Uh, but look, H- Haley Atwell is pretty much good in every movie that she's in. Um, she's a very good actress, so I think she can be a good addition. It's just that, uh, who would she play? That that that's my biggest question. Like, who would she play? What type of character would she be? And yeah, that's considering that she's the lead of the movie. Like, huh. Uh, I hope they don't replace Ilsa Faust played by Rebecca Ferguson, who is phenomenal in those movies. Um, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see what uh, what she does. But uh, I'm very interested what will happen. All right. Nico? Uh, I'm a fan of Haley Atwell's, uh, so uh, any news about her getting something new to do is always fun for me. But again, this is a franchise that I haven't really visited yet. Uh, I just know it as the franchise in which Tom Cruise is constantly jumping out of moving vehicles uh, from various heights uh, uh, and altitudes. So it's a uh, franchise where Tom Cruise does everything, like everything. He runs, he jumps, he just every type of stupid thing that he could possibly do that was probably uh, life-threatening, he does in those movies. Yeah, Scientology gives you the power to do crazy shit. <laughs> don't don't quote me on that. No, that is not true at all. Uh, but That's right, Nico Rigoli. <laughs> oh dear lord. Um, th- this is good news, but I think it's not going to be one of those things that pulls you in to go see the movie. What's going to pull you in to go see the movie is when the, that first trailer comes out and you see Tom Cruise doing one of those crazy stunts that we just mentioned. Uh, and uh, you're going to get a small taste of it, and then you're going to want to go to the theaters to see how did he not die this time. Yeah, because that's kind of that's kind of been his thing. Is like you know he's so committed to actually doing his own stunts that he actually puts his life on the line each time. You know, he actually hangs above you know a, a, a tower in Abu Dhabi, and then he literally hangs from the side of a plane, and then he literally jumps out of space, basically, like. What what's left for him to do? Um, he's Look, going to fly into the sun. So, by the way, Tom, Tom Cruise is, I believe, in his sixties. He is going to die doing a Mission Impossible movie. <laughs> you, th- you know what? I, I I'd be afraid to take that bet because I have a feeling I'd lose money on it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's definitely gonna happen, and you know, good good for him that he's still you know keeping his career alive. That he's still doing his thing, uh, but yeah, no, it should be. Uh, as I say, and K Wolf brings up a, a great a great question here: over under fifty percent chance that he injures himself again in the next film. Um, over, over. I mean, the fact that he hasn't yet is kind of crazy, considering Sylvester Stallone broke his neck, I think, in the first Expendables movie, just getting slammed into a wall. And yet Tom Cruise can hang off of a helicopter at I- extreme heights and not have anything go wrong for him. Yeah, fair. Fair enough. Uh, n- next thing I want to hit real quick. Uh, Case. 
I'm also going to throw this over to you because there were a couple of stories that you wanted to, to you you asked me to put in today before I did the show notes and yeah. uh, one of the pieces that got brought up was the fact that well South Park fans uh, it seems we don't necessarily have to worry about uh, South Park hitting Family Guy slash Simpsons syndrome where it's going to run too long. You know, uh, apparently it was. Well, sorry, go, go. Uh, take over. To, to, be, to be fair, South Park has been running longer than Family Guy. Um, not a, not quite as long as The Simpsons, but um, like unlike The Simpsons, it's actually still good, and it has been good for about every season that they've put out. The only dud that I would really say that I'm not a fan of that season is season 15. That is one season in 22 so far. Um, and I'm like, uh, the the show may have changed over time, and the current uh, version of South Park uh, that we're seeing is definitely different from how it started and how it has evolved. But um, like the core of South Park is they make fun of um, real life issues, uh, political issues, social issues, all kinds of stuff that is just popular in the world um, because. Well, to be fair, the m- most things that they tackle, you can so easily make fun of. Uh, and I still think they do that very well. Espe- like, even in the last season, uh, a couple of the things that they tackled in the last season is just so hilarious uh, that I think, yeah, where can they go wrong? And I was delighted to hear that they, are, uh, they will uh, do the next season, season 23, and after that, three more seasons uh, at least. We don't know anything after that yet. But we know at least that it's going to run until at least uh, 2022. So that's a while. I'm very happy with that because I love South Park. I have watched the show multiple times, all of it, uh, from the beginning until uh, the season 22, several times. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I have a theory here. <laughs> I feel like this is Comedy Central's decision. And not Trey Parker and Matt Stones. Because if you look at the last episode of the most recent season, in a way, they were kind of through the characters of the show. They were begging for the show to get canceled. They were like, we've thrown so much at this wall and you're still accepting this. What's it going to take to get you to let us go? Uh, 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 Because eventually they are going to run out of ideas. And I think that's what they're afraid of is that they're reaching... Their breaking point. Uh, I, I, I don't think you'll run out of ideas with social and political issues that will form every day. Like for the next season, already I know a couple of things that they could uh, definitely do and make fun of. Uh, one of the things that I'm just I'm dying for to see a South Park episode on the Area 51 raid. <laughs> I want to see this happen. Oh, I know shit. it will that be was good. a thing. That was a thing. Yeah. It's still a thing going to happen next month apparently yeah, like, uh, apparently no <laughs> next week it's supposed to happen oh next week it's supposed to oh, happen on, it's supposed to happen actually a week from today supposedly september and 20th what day what day does the south park season premiere this coming one you, you, i believe so it'll be very very fresh in their minds and therefore it'll fit the topical nature of like because south park is only made that, that, it, within south the south week park that always, the episode airs that's what south park always does they did the exact same thing uh, right after 9/11, that they put out, uh, Osama bin Laden has party pants. Like they can, they, they have always been so spot on with uh, tackling some kind of uh, news story. And I was like, yeah, the Area 51 thing, they should tackle that because it's definitely something you can make fun of. And I think that could also be perfect uh, example of a Randy episode because Randy is always the most hypocritical um, character in the entire show. Well, he'll, he'll have one standpoint at the beginning of the episode, and then he'll join the thing that he was against the beginning uh, and be the leader. So he'll uh, like he'll probably be against the Area 51 raid, and at the end he'll be leading the Area 51 raid. That's what okay. I think. <laughs> okay, cool guy. Kenneth Lee, you've officially gone too far. <laughs> I, I we it's, Family Guy tried that with Steely and Brian. I do not want to see Butters get impregnated by Cartman. That is too much. No, no, <laughs> hell no. Y- y- I, I, if I could, I would ban you from the chat right now. That that is too far, too far. Yeah, but, oh, that's not too far. 
Parkins don't do well, such no, a thing. No, he said he he doesn't want that. So that the show does he doesn't want that to happen. And it's like, yeah, that would be great if it didn't happen because um, that episode of Family Guy was awful. And yeah, Seth MacFarlane is kind of in the same boat where he's just like he's desperate to close his baby because Family he, Guy had its he run. Been out of ideas for uh, five years at least. That's there's different. <laughs> yeah. And, and okay, Robert, I I haven't seen the episode about last night, uh, but where they, they apparently made one about an event that happened twenty four hours prior. Which hey, like that's. You know, respectable, but I think you know, as we've all kind of agreed, they're sort of on their last legs. And maybe, it, maybe it's good that they're gonna call it and call it call it good while they're still on top, rather than running the risk of going too long and just running out of things to to say. Plus, I think it's f- fair time that uh, Trey and Matt. I don't know how else to say this. Find a new hobby. You know, find something new to. <laughs> To, to put their energy into. They're filmmakers. Yeah. They're always filmmakers. So they, they will always have the want, the drive to make um, any kind of film or TV show that um, well, they want to make. Because like I, I'm, I'm essentially behind them on any project because even Team America for Wolf Police is hilarious. <laughs> Could could they do uh, another Broadway play? Because the Book of Mormon is still fantastic, no oh, matter how many it's... times you see it. Uh, and you know, I'd I'd love to see them maybe do something based off of the Game of Thrones spoof that they did on Broadway. Yeah, fair enough. Just uh... have an entire choir singing Wiener uh, over and over again. It would be magnificent, <laughs> especially if you're like watching old people walk out of the theater thinking, I thought this was going to be a wholesome play. How dare they talk about wieners? <laughs> we spent too much time on this topic. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we did, in fairness. Uh, now, speaking of Game of Thrones, though, Case, there was something you wanted to mention about the prequel that is currently looking to get greenlit by HBO about, uh, about House Targaryen. Well, I'm very happy with this news, considering that House Targaryen is my favorite house in Game of Thrones. Um, and I'm very interested to see uh, what they can do with the prequel. Um, I don't know if this is if this is the prequel that they're gonna that they wanted to do about like uh, the first men with rising raising the wall against the White Walkers at the beginning. I don't know. Um, I just know the Targaryens have a very interesting history. And we don't know much about it. We've only heard mentions about it that I'm like, huh, I, I, I want to see what, what happened. Um, and we're probably going to get a whole lot of incest with that because <laughs> the, uh, one of the first things they say in the show is that uh, Targaryens have been, um, uh, have been bedding uh, brothers and sisters for, uh, for centuries to keep the bloodlines pure. So, yeah, that, that'll be a thing. Uh, and that, that like, um, it's it's not that I'm looking forward to it because it's kind of fucked up, but I'm just interested to see how that goes. The family history of Targaryens, because you know, it's, yeah, they're they're probably one of the most interesting families based off Game of Thrones because in Game of Thrones we only really have uh, Daenerys, and but we keep hearing about this dynasty that they had where the Targaryens were the rulers for so long. And we keep hearing about um, Ray. Shit. R- Rhaegar and his father before him, and then the other members of the Targaryen yeah, line, and, like, and of course uh, the Targaryens built the Iron Throne. Just you know, there, yeah. there's a lot, there's a lot to, uh, there's a lot to be shown in that series. So I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Fair enough. Uh, and there was one, one final uh, story that I want to hit before, before we have to hit the audible. And okay. Gentlemen, one of my favorite dumb action movies, which I talked about on our on one of the very first episodes of this show, is a little film from 1997. Stars John Travolta, stars Nicolas Cage, both giving some of their best work in the history of cinema. Now, Nico, 
Have you any thoughts about the movie Face Off? I've seen the honest trailer for it. And this is a movie that should not have worked as well as it did. Have not seen the movie itself. I just I just know that like they, they switch faces. You've got John Travolta pretending to be Nicolas Cage and vice versa. And somehow their wives don't realize that they're not messing with their husbands because apparently once you switch faces, you also switch bodies. Um, so that's a big plot hole in the, in the original movie. Um, who would you... Th- th- that seems to be the big question. Is who would you get for this remake? Like, who's... Cr- and obviously, with this kind of premise, you'd want two people who look almost entirely different because then it makes things interesting. Uh, Tom Hardy and Michael Fassbender. Mm, just or, throwing two or, names out there. I'll say, or or just, just for the X-Men <laughs> connection, McAvoy and Fassbender. Uh, th- th- that's the thing. Everyone will make the everyone will make the X Men um, uh, X Men connection with that one. So you need, you need the actors who haven't really been in the movie together. I'm hmm. I'm tempted to throw out a very oddball pick here. Um, Case and myself. <laughs> no, no. I'm actually going to go with uh, two veteran actors who are just kind of getting back into the spotlight again. Eddie Murphy and Carl Weathers. You know, I actually don't hate that. I don't hate that. Because uh, it, 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 like the ridiculousness of it, it falls into Eddie Murphy's comedy background. Uh, Carl Weathers, he's a guy who can do it all. Uh, so I, I feel like there's a lot of potential there if you get those two guys who obviously Carl Weathers is making a comeback with the Mandalorian and Eddie Murphy is making uh, a comeback with this comedy special he's doing on Netflix. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that too. So I, I feel like you do the face off remake with them. This will really help get them back on top. Well, like right, Brian Newsbaum has <laughs> some perfect pit no picks. Oh uh, dear Lord! Jeff, Jeff Goldblum and Tom Dagnino, <laughs> or Tommy Wiseau and Christopher Walken. I I need to see that movie. <laughs> I I don't know how you do the stunts with those two, <laughs> but uh, you don't. You don't. But uh, fair point. Fair point. And and, and that w- that would be a lot of fun. Um, case. Please, uh, please, please speak to the audience just for a moment. Just w- warm them up for me, if you could. About what? About what? About Face Off. About this reboot that's happening, and I'm, I have some thoughts. Guys, why does the original fucking movie have ninety-two percent on Rotten Tomatoes? It makes zero sense to me. I still haven't seen it, but there is no way that movie can be like better than. I don't know, some, some of the uh, movies in the, well, low 90. Heck, Force Awakens has a lesser score. You cannot convince me in a million years that Face Off is better than The Force Awakens. Are you kidding me? So, like, if you if you do a reboot, remake, or anything, cast you good actors that could work. Not Nicolas Cage and John Travolta overacting times a million. Ugh. Oh. But- but they're arguably they're part of the reason why this movie that shouldn't have worked did is because they're ridiculous enough to pull off the plot. Now that we understand that there are holes in this plot, uh, you you get uh, it helps to get two serious actors that can also handle the ridiculousness of <laughs> this this plot and and make it work. Hence my suggestion for Carl Weathers and Eddie Murphy. They're two really good actors who can handle ridiculousness when needed. Okay. Okay. Chris, go. Gladly. Betty White and Cicely Tyson. Wow. You know what? I'd rather see that than whatever the fuck they're trying to do here, Paramount. Why? Why? (sighs) Fucking, like, seriously, okay. This movie is actually terrible when you stop to think about it. But in, in a strange way. 
the terribleness turns itself into good because of just how bad shit insane it is. This movie can't work in 2019. Are you fucking kidding me? This could only work in 1997 when dumb action films were at their absolute fucking peak. And now we're going to, and because and, and, here's the other thing too, this movie had a sense of humor. And the, the sense of humor was brought out through the acting. But here's the problem. We're going to get someone who is, you know, so, super serious with their directing. And he's going to be like, we're going to f- find the soul of this movie. And we're going to expose it. And we're going to show all of you, oh, this movie actually has something on its mind. It's going to say something serious about our society and our culture. No, 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 no. That's not what Face Off is. Face Off is two guys trying to kill each other, and they swap faces. That is fucking it. That's all you fucking need for this movie. Don't fucking touch it. I know you're broke for ideas, Paramount, because your Transformers movies, they just don't make money anymore because they're all fucking shit. Your Star Trek movies don't make any more money because you don't know how to market them. So what the fuck are you trying to do? Jesus! I hate this. One, one last point. One last point. And I'm mostly just going to say this to make you guys angry. Um, Wait, no. The, no, I have the, it. If you, if you want the two stars of dumb action movies today, you cast Gerard Butler and D- Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> I'm not even mad. That's how you'd have to do it. But no. Again, because we're going to get, you know, they're going to get some, some director who's like a high concept thing. You're going to turn this into a high concept art piece. Don't fucking do that it would be like if you remade die hard except you're trying to make it high concept oh wait a minute they've already done that 20 fucking times it only worked the first time because that was the only time it could work it is the is the episode of the clone wars where obi-wan makes himself look like reiko hardeen is that like star wars's equivalent of face off but it worked Case is mad at me now. <laughs> it worked. Plus, that is a that different, is different thing altogether. Different. Completely different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna blow a fucking fuse on this show one day. I swear to God. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, all right. Our, fir- our our anniversary show is also our last. Thank you all for the. <laughs> Yeah, I know, right? Da na 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 na. Um, okay, okay. Let's now let's get into the audible that I that I called earlier. And so before we, you know, about an hour before we started the show, uh, something dropped, something very huge. That being the bracket for the Movie Trivia Showdown Teams Tournament of 2019. Now, guys. We're not going to predict the entire tournament. I did. That's fine. But as far as tonight goes, and guys, I want you to join in the chat with who you have for each matchup as well, please. But I want to take the next 10, 15 minutes or so, and we're just going to sort of quickly go through all the round one matchups, and we're just going to give some quick thoughts on who we think is going to take each match. Sound good? Uh, Robert, you are so biased in this regard. <laughs> Robert, I do not blame you for the bias. You have every right to feel as you do, sir. But, uh, yeah. yeah. So, well, and first off, how surprised are we that we actually got the bracket this early? Yeah, I am surprised. And uh, I think that was Christian's intention because that was also his post. Like, uh, hey, look at what, what I have here way early. <laughs> This this whole past seven days has basically been a sorry for Arizona getting canceled. Here's a Willy Wonka <laughs> opportunity, which I'm going to. Uh, yes, yes, yes. He, here's a bunch of Schmodown throwdowns to keep you entertained. Uh, and here's the bracket for the team's tournament. Have at it. Fair enough, fair enough. But yeah, so we're going to start this off with uh, the number one seed and the number 16 seed. Look, this is going to be so one-sided, it's not even funny. Sorry, Robert. Thank you for your contribution to Only Stupid Answers, but um, Odd Couple is going to smoke them. Look, without Robert, Only Stupid Answers has less of a shot of beating Odd Couple 
than they do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I know I've been the guy who's disagreed with both of these two lately, but um, I, I feel like, Robert, you brought something to the team. Uh, mm-hmm. And now that you've kind of gone back home to Texas, um, I don't know if That's Sam and I, I don't I don't think Sam and DJ can uh, uh, can really pull it off. Uh, I don't know how much they train in the off season. I know how much the odd couple does train in the off season, so I'm going to go with the former champs. Yeah, it, it's not even a question. Up next, uh, we have I believe it's the number five taking on the number twelve seed. Uh, and that is Shazam taking on the movie guys. Again, look, Paul Preston has been impressing everybody with his run in the tournament, with his past matches. But this is where the luck runs out, plain and simple. Like, cause, I'm sorry, Paul can't carry Chris to, to a win. Whereas Brendan has only been improving more and more, as we saw with Shazam's first match and his match against Whitney. And Bibbs, do I need to say anything else? Bibbs is Bibbs. Now, to be fair, Bibbs does not have the most amount of luck in team tournaments, but I think he should be able to pull this one off. <laughs> I'm going to go with Shazam on this one, but we've only seen a very limited amount from Chris so far. We've seen a lot from Paul, but not a lot from Chris. So I, will, I won't be totally surprised if he shows some improvement from his last performance. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, moving on to the uh, third match in the bracket, that being <laughs> Time Machine Time versus Machine. the Scream Queens. Again, this one's way too easy to call. It's Time Machine. I I, I wish it wasn't that easy to call. I wish that... Um, look. Scream Queens, I think they're good, and I think they have proven uh, several times that they can be better than some people expect them to be. Uh, but, you know, it, it's Ethan Irwin, who was a champ, and um, Janine, who is supposed to be a champ at one point in anything, because I think she's really good and she can get there. So, yeah. <laughs> I love the Scream Queens, but it's Janine's time, and she's got Ethan right next to her. Uh, and and Haley Fouch has not had the best season this year, uh, so it's been kind of a rough time for that team. I feel like they're going to bounce back in 2020, but I feel like it's just Time Machine's time to shine. No pun intended there. Oh, shit. Sorry. Uh, I believe I did mess that up. Uh, I, I guess I, for some reason, said that the movie guy's uh, – Paul's partner name was Chris. Sorry, I believe his name actually is Adam. So, my bad. No, no, no. You're you're not his teammate. Adam is. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. No, so, so you know, <laughs> if I was dealing with Paul Preston, we would actually be pretty good. But you know, probably. Yeah, because he watches all those bro douche movies that I don't watch. So <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, uh, and then last, okay. Fuck it, I'm going for two rants uh, here. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I'm- yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hold up! What are you doing? What are you doing? Why are you trying to break my damn heart in this damn tournament? Come on, man! Ah! Like, seriously, dude. Why? Why would you put the Looney Bin against the Self-Righteous Brothers? Because, like, like, Video Drew, she she is. She is God. She is the greatest thing to happen to the showdown. And then you put her against Whitney and Hoik, who... I'm sure, as Nico's going to remind me, you know, they'll they'll grasp defeat from the jaws of victory. And, yeah, sure, whatever. Harloff! Why? Why? Ah! Look, I, I... Obviously, when you host a podcast about movies, you know a lot about movies. So I'm not going to take that away from Whitney. The movies he just knows a lot about rarely ever come up in the schmodown, and That's he true. he bites the dust for it every single time. Uh, like it, it, so, and the Looney Bin, for the small amount of time that we've seen them, they've really taken this game by storm. Uh, like, what the hell is his name? Tom. Tom. We don't know his last Tom. name. We don't know his. We nickname. don't need a last we, name. Tom. He just needs to we, compete. <laughs> We don't know where he came from, but he obviously knows a shit ton about movies, and it showed when he 
took the current champion uh, and his partner to the limit in both of yep. their team's debuts. So I have the loony yeah. bin taking this one. Me too, actually. Because, uh, look, I, I, I think that Whitney and Hoyk uh, can be a very good team. They showed that in last year's tournament. But, um, yeah, Whitney and Matches uh, just don't really go together, period. Um, as, as much, uh, look, you can say all the things you want about critically acclaimed getting a title shot against the Sirewolves. That's Bibbs. That's not Whitney. Whitney is definitely the lesser of those two. That's why I do think that Bibbs definitely got a, a big upgrade with um, Meyer. Um, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one was the toughest one for me to call, but I eventually went with the Looney Bin because I think that, um, yeah, that they they might might have started off with um, some losses, but they are the team who uh, have since uh, that those losses were no were no big losses, and I think that both of them, uh, both Tom and Video Drew, uh, have been improving and can actually. Um, they could get far. I don't have them going very far, but at least I have them winning that first match. <laughs> and either way, I don't win. I just die inside. I hope you are all happy. <laughs> <sighs> but then we move on to, again, I'm sorry, we're back to an easy call here, at least for me. That is Inky and the Brain versus Who's the Boss. Look, no spoiler alert, spoiler alert for uh, today's match because Rachel Silvestrini is getting real damn good at this game. I can't say that for Devon. No. And you have former two-time champ and Ben Bateman <clears throat> up against Rachel and Devon. It just... Come on. And look, by all means, Silvestrini, like, worshippers, come at me. Come at me. Tell me I'm wrong. Please. Tell me. But the the, look, odd, the, um, odd, the odds are 85-15. Yeah, pretty the, much. This is going to be my, my dark horse pick. I, I Of course it is. Of course. <laughs> and may, maybe it's bias. It, 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 it very it – yeah, you, you're not wrong there. But but having said that, I've made it clear. Rachel uh, Silvestrini is like the mama bear of the schmo down behind the scenes. She keeps things in line, and she makes uh, she helps make sure that show goes off without a hitch, including her own matches. She knows how to keep Devon in check, and Riley has had a tough time this season. Uh, ben has only had one win this season. Uh, so, like, even though who's the boss is technically the defending tournament champs, who's to say that the, uh, they haven't had a great season this time around? Uh, and I, I feel like the picking might be right for an upset with Inky in the brain. Sorry, Nico. I'm right there with Case. I like, start seriously, you do not even realize how wrong you are in this case. Look, uh, Ben Bateman is arguably one of the best players who have never held a belt. Now that ben, and Draco actually did win, uh, win a belt. Um, and Mark Riley, um, my, he might have lost against Stacey, but he's still a really good player. And who's the boss? Look, uh, look, look at the record that Bateman and Riley have in team tournaments. Um, Bateman's first team tournament, he got to the final with uh, Andrew Guy of all people, and then uh, the next year he wins the tournament and uh, goes up against the Shia Wolves, narrowly losing. Uh, Riley um, got to the semis as, uh, of the yeah, 2017 with, tournament. With, yeah, you're with, not uh, you're not telling me stuff I don't already know because I already know this. That's, that's but you got to you also got to look at no, what no, no, have they done for us thought. lately. Let me finish my goddamn thought. Jesus all Christ. right, all right, all right, all right. All right. So look, um, they're they're great players, and oh oh my God, they might not have the best uh, have had the best season. You know why? Because they have had really fucking tough competition in this season. Uh, Bateman lost uh, his last match against Ka against an on fire Kalinowski, and that Kalinowski was dangerous, uh, and he actually like. <clears throat> 
that's the thing. Bateman loses to very good people uh, because, well, Bateman is he's up there, but he can't quite get where uh, like to uh, number one contender matches and title matches. But at least in teams, uh, one thing that Who's the Boss has shown is that they're extremely good as a team. Um, and where uh, it doesn't matter how Bateman or Riley do individually. But together as a team, they're really good because they have only lost to champions as a team. The Odd Couple was a champion and the Shia Wolf were a champion. Those are the only two losses. So uh, Inky and the Brain have no chance. I'm sorry. But. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I, feel, I feel bad that I once again have to pretty much shit on Inky and the Brain because I, I say every time they're going to lose or, pretty, or a lot of times I've said that. Uh, so I'm sorry. I I don't mean to like shit on them as people or anything. I just think, yeah, sorry, you just have a little bit too much, uh, too much, to, oh. too, too much on your plate to to, to, yes. to pull this one out. That was, that was what I was looking for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, sorry, Nico. <clears throat> one, one last point, and then we'll really quickly hit the uh, <clears throat> rest. Ones. I just feel like. We see this game come a lot down to the questions. I feel like Devon might get some that he really knows, and that'll play a big factor in how this match ends. Because okay, he's he's mind. the outlier. He's the outlier, and, and and if he gets the questions that he knows, we're we're in for an upset. Funny. Sure. Because actually, where I think you're wrong about this particular match is where I think is going to happen. <laughs> In the follow in the next match, loose cannons versus Crimson Fury. This is a difficult one. <laughs> this is really difficult because difficult. Stacy and Tim actually balance each other really well. Yes. As we saw in their match against Late to the Party. So So I am sorry to do this, but yeah, Paul, his run in teams is all is gonna be done after this match. I'm calling it right now. That This is my dark horse to actually get to the semis. Because I think they can take down who's the boss, too. Because, <clears throat> well, Stacy does have that win over Riley, and he, Riley does have a history of kind of losing the same people over and over again, usually. Mm. So, yeah, I, I, I actually do think that, you know, Paul and Zipper... As good as they are as a team, and granted, we I'm sure Kaiser has been working Zipper to the bone. But it's not going to work for them this time. It's just not. So, now by all means, tell me why I'm wrong. I have loose cannons, uh, but that's, that's because um, I haven't seen enough of Tim to really be convinced that... Uh, the, he has had two matches, I believe, a singles and a teams match. Um, so that's not enough to really make me feel. Oh, he is a, a settled, experienced competitor that will know to uh, how to deal with this, because he's going up against no less than the current singles champ, Paul Yama, and Eric Zipper, who is essentially a player that Paul needs in his team. Because if you look at Paul's teammates um, in the fan leagues. Michael, uh, Michael Campbell and um, Lucas, Lucas Schildbach. Uh, Paul is usually the better out of the two. Now, I'm not saying that M Michael or Lucas are bad, but they are like good backup players to Paul, who is definitely the better of the team. And it's the same case in this case, case for Eric Zipper, where Zipper is good enough to make sure that Paul can do what he, do, uh, what he does and that's win. Uh, and... Crimson Fury is definitely a good team, but Stacy is too inconsistent with her performances because, yes, one day she might win, well, uh, last year in a singles tournament against uh, Mark Ellis, and this year, oh, not last year, two years ago, I believe. Yeah. yeah, two years. But, yeah, she can win against Mark Ellis, and then the next match, she gets KO'd by Rachel Cushing. Th that's how inconsistent she is. So I don't think uh, that, like... I don't know what to think of that, and I think that uh, at least Paul and Zippo are a little bit more consistent in that regard, because at least Paul is consistent. And Tim, I just don't know enough about. That's why I have loose cannons for me. And for, for me, a great coach can turn a 
uh, can turn a mediocre slash good player into a really great player. And that, and in that case, Kaiser has done that for uh, for Zipper because Zipper was struggling last year, and he struggled at the beginning of this year. Albeit, uh, he uh, he and Winston did take corruption to the last round to the last question. It, it was just a matter of didn't work out in their favor. And then they split up, and then Zipper was kind of like unfocused. Kaiser gave him focus. Kaiser put him on the war path, and he has been on that war path uh, uh, since the halfway point of the season. Uh, and Paul, we already knew how good he was, and uh, he didn't really need Kaiser to make him great, but he, uh, but Kaiser has helped him become more organized uh, in his greatness. Uh, and so I feel like the the reign of Paul Oyama as an undefeated team's competitor, will continue here in this match. Okay. Uh, get ready for the fastest uh, skip past the match in the history of skipping past the match. <laughs> Family versus Wild Berries. Family. Family. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. It's just a matter of will anything get broken and who will be intoxicated by the end of the match. Uh, I think, well, here's the thing. I think all of our brains going to be broken because of all the stupidity coming out of Makuga and Elliot's mouths. But, yeah, that's that's going to be it. And all the crap coming out of a uh, guy's mouth as well. But, yeah, it's it's no-brainer. And the last yeah, one, it, this is it, tough. I, I do want to say the shit talk for this match is going to be insane. Uh, and th- this will probably be the most shit talk for a not – that good match that we've ever seen. <laughs> oh yeah, but no. Let, and let's uh, <clears throat> let's just get this out of the way right now. This is probably the second toughest match to call in the yes. bracket. Evil Geniuses versus the Paddington Two. Now, the Paddington Two. I'm gonna pull a Nico here for just a second. I think Matt Achity and Alonzo Duralde are both better competitors than the rest of us give them credit for. Credit for being. They are good competitors. They are. They are solid. I mean, shit. Atchity competed for a title match. Or competed for a yeah. title shot. Yeah. But Exactly. Actually you know. went to sudden death in that title match. Yes, and, and they would have won if he had just stayed if he had just, you know, not stayed in character, but what are you gonna do? Um oh, yeah. Jesus. you know, but But you're also up against Lon Harris and JTE. Now Sure, in singles, Lon has been struggling. I think is a fair assessment. But put JT in, JT in there, who has been absent for a good chunk of this season. He still has a lot of that fire. He still has a lot of that knowledge in him. Because, you know, when you work at Screen Junkies, you're around movies all day. Yes. So... I don't know, like somebody, Nico. Is there something I'm overlooking in regards to where I should go with this one? Uh, where I'm, I keep going back to how JTE let those questions in the Liz Shannon Miller match get the better of him in round two. Like, I don't. Uh, Jonathan Harris, as his manager, really did nothing to help calm him down in that situation and keep him composed. And JTE is one of those guys who takes the competition seriously, much like Lon does. For Achity and Duralde, they show up to play, but they show up to play because it's fun. Like they're they're happy if they get a win, but they're not really mad if they don't. So if they get questions they don't know, I don't think they'll be phased too much by it. Um, so. Mm, this is hard, but because I think I actually said Evil Geniuses before we went on air, but I think I'm going to change my pick right here, right now, to the Paddington 2. Fair enough. Case? Um, despite JTE not having a whole lot of uh, matches this year, and Long being a little wonky in singles, I do think as a team they're a lot better. Uh, we unfortunately haven't seen enough of that team. But look, uh, JTE and teams is a success story, period. Uh, because he and fucking Dagnino almost became champions a few years ago 
um, barely losing to the Schmo. Uh, that that's just crazy that that had happened in the first place. Then he formed a team with Snyder, uh, which was uh, what was oh right the most successful team in Schmo in history. Huh? Yeah, that happened. Uh, and now uh, he is also there. There are two and zero. So Lon and JTE just seems to work. Considering that, uh, I think they'll win. But the Pennington 2 will definitely give him a fight. And I look, I wouldn't be surprised if the Pennington 2 wins because the Pennington 2, uh, yeah, they're good. And uh, that's the thing. The Pennington 2 doesn't seem to uh, the need to play a lot to still perform well because they hardly, they hardly play. And every, like every time they play, there's a big gap between uh, their match in the last match and then the next one. Uh, but they still perform well regardless. So, yeah, like the, uh, I'm not counting them out. I'm just saying JTE and teams, it's just a success story. But, so I think Evil Genius will be. Fair enough. And uh, before we hit the break real fast, I just wanted to give a quick shout-out to uh, Thrawn2k5, who's in the chat. And I just need to give you some props, sir. Party in the Far Tower. 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 Dude, that song kicks ass. Thank you for creating that song, sir. You are the best. Love you. So, yeah, and, and that's, I guess, okay, if I have to make a pick, I don't know if it will go on my bracket because I haven't officially made my bracket yet. I'm choosing to be smart about my bracket this time. Shut up, Nico. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think right now, as much as it, be- as much as it behooves me, <clears throat> I think I'll have to go with Evil Geniuses. I might change my mind before I actually make the bracket, but we'll mm. see what happens there. And, guys, we are going to take a quick five-minute break, and as soon as we get back, we're going to continue celebrating the one year of this channel by talking about our favorite movies of all time. So please leave yours in the chat. Leave them on the Facebook group. And, guys, we'll see you shortly. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. Yoga? Um, yeah, so like I'm going to be matching um, muscles to the specific area of the body in which they reside. So it's related to yoga. And also I think there's something about like um, uh, myths of dieting, something like that as well. I mean, it's not like... Uh, like Hashtag like, okay. Yoga Rigoli. Let's make this happen, folks. This is... Like, I'm not I, I, I'm not making fun of you because, you know, oh, yoga's such a win Like, no, it's just... No, 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 first off, let me stab you right there. See, so don't be dissing yoga. I'm not dissing. Let's just make that perfectly clear. Yoga is a very legitimate... Uh, Almost like I'm almost like, well, it's an art art form unto itself. It's very, it's very therapeutic. It's It calms the mind. It's... I just think it's funny that you're that you're in a class, but you know what? If you're doing, I, it, I need the decompression. I, I need the decompression, especially with what we do. We sit in front of a computer screen and just talk, and, and occasionally lift up a whiteboard and write on it with a marker. Uh, like you do that enough times, and your body is going to atrophy. So, like getting that, uh, you you understand the benefits of physical activity. You've been preparing for a role for a show you're writing. Yeah. Uh, 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 and meanwhile, I've been struggling to get back to the dojo and get back to my black belt self. And that's partly because I've been uh, afraid of like I lost a lot of muscle in the time that I've been sitting on this couch talking in front of all of our fans uh, on this computer. Uh, oh, so, like, it, so, so it's all, all of their fault. I see. how. <laughs> uh, don't don't. Uh, you you know what I mean. I, I know There's, what you're saying. Deftones to me has always been one of those bands who's had an album for every step of my life, and I love that they are just this old band, perfectly set from like my time span of being alive. In that, whenever I was listening to White Pony for the first time, all of that had very like everything is teenage angsty titles in their own song. Like it's literally made for me at my teenage years and even like my younger years as I was listening to it. So. Then 2003 hits, that's when Deftones, the self-titled album, drops. That is me at 13. That is me with Three Days Grace's first album, emo, cringy, hardcore teenager. And Deftones self-titled hits that perfectly with that tone. I was so angry, and it had so much raw scream. Hexagram is just how many? Four minutes of screaming straight. Um, just raw, visceral screaming and stuff like that. And all a lot of the rest of it just had some nice, sad, melancholy notes that I think 
just lands perfectly for that teenage angst feeling I was at. So self-titled, for a very long explanation, is my number three. But, uh, yeah, that was a little embarrassing. Josh Makuga is embarrassed for you, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> seriously, getting getting a spun, you know, opponent's choice, it's it's always kind of it's always kind of the sword in you. you know, really, today. Uh, really, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. I greatly appreciate you calling him Makuga. Uh, Thanks, damn, Jess. Julia. That was me and Mark. Uh, Jesus. If they'd asked me Oscar questions about the 1930s. I would be okay, but they didn't do that. No, because all they the Oscars questions Chicago. have to come out in the last 20 years, because that's the only movie the game we fucking cares about. I can tell you're a little butthurt about that still, but, um, you know, yeah. obviously it also... Buttered, battered, and bitter. This is an unsafe working environment right now. Cool. Obviously, I can tell you're a little upset, too, because... And welcome back to the second half of the Who Cares Anime Podcast. I hope my volume's a little better, Thron. Thank you for the heads up in the chat. I appreciate that very much, good sir. But, yeah, so, as I mentioned, uh, you know, and as we've been talking about in the Facebook group, as we've been talking about everywhere else, we are now here because a year, roughly a year ago, we talked about some of our favorite movies. We gave a couple, and... Most of the ones that I brought up then, I'm actually not bringing up now. That was a, a case rule there, not my rule. Otherwise, uh, my list would be kind of boring. We also had one major rule when we were putting this, these these lists together. No Star Wars. And it killed me. It kills me as well. But the thing is, if we are going to talk about Star Wars, we could talk for years. So... We'll, we'll, we'll talk about Star Wars closer to the Rise of Skywalker. We will. And I think what we might actually do is maybe sort of like the, uh, the, the, the the Disney episode we had. I might just ask everybody in the fan league community to send me their Star Wars ranking. And maybe we can have some fun as far as, you know, where does everybody rank their movies? And I think just for funsies, I might even allow the... Uh, the non-canon stuff to make an appearance, like the oh. holiday special, the Ewoks movies, because no, I, no, I can, no, I, I can no. make that ranking. No, I can I cannot. So let's not do that. <laughs> I think we're going. I think we're going to do it I, anyway. I, st I still need to watch the holiday special because I lost a bet and I never yeah. followed through on that bet. You you, you better follow. Well, okay, I, I lost a bet and said I had said I would watch Catwoman and I or said I, sorry said I had to do a review of Catwoman and I still haven't made good on that bet. But uh, lose you, Matt Kearns. And come to uh, think of it, I case I think I lost to you <laughs> with that bet. With what bet? With the, with the watch the holiday special, I I, I think oh, it was right. for our oh, yeah that poorly written Full Metal uh, uh, trivia call out match uh, that uh, was full of a bunch of deep cuts that Sandy wrote just to stump you, uh, stumped and me and, and with it he screwed you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah yeah. But yeah, so 
here's how I think. Uh, here's how I think we're gonna do this. You know, and if for some reason we wind up having the same movies on our list, which I'm pretty sure we won't, but what I think we're gonna do I, is we're just gonna I essentially overlap. We might have a couple. And I do have two, I do have two cheats technically on my list. I'd that's be because, surprised. That's be, and, the, and the reason I say that they're cheats is because of how I personally view the films when I watch them. Fair enough. So, uh, so yeah, guys. Like I said, start listing some of your favorites, and I think how we're gonna do this is we're gonna, so we got ten films that we're doing here. Yeah. I think we should do what are ten through six, and then five through two, and then ones. This sure. is going to be hard for me because I don't actually have numbers put down next to these <laughs> movies. Well then, just, well, then, well, then for you, just just go with you know the first five you want to talk about, and then your next four you want to talk about, and then obviously your number one. Okay. Fair. Yes. All right. So then, Nico, why don't you uh, start us off? Jumanji, welcome to the jungle. <laughs> I did not know what I was going to get when I first saw this movie. I basically, uh, we, we did, uh, the, every couple months, Penn State New Ken does a drive-in style movie. When it's raining, we just watch it in the gymnasium or the theater. Uh, but nice. when it's not raining and the weather's nice, we watch it in the athletic center parking lot. Uh, we did this one in the gymnasium. And while it was hard to hear, I will never forget <laughs> Kevin Hart exploding because he was allergic to cake. <laughs> and that that's a, from that from that moment onward, this became one of my favorite, albeit stupid, but uh, favorite movies, um, because like it acknowledges what it is. It's will it, and it still has a good time. It's it's a it's a fun popcorn flick that you can have a good time with. All right. Agreed. I mean, I like it. I wouldn't put it that high. But no, I, hey, I, you know, I, I I wouldn't put it anywhere near my favorite, but I had a lot of fun watching it. Same, same. The ne- maybe maybe favorite is a wrong word, but again, these are movies that I like. Some of them are my true favorites, but again, you guys rewatch movies pretty much every day. I rarely find time to rewatch anything throughout the entire week, especially when school is going on. So, yeah, this is from a different perspective than you guys who are diehard movie guys. That's fair. All right. Well, what's your next one? He's a lot more diehard than I am. Oh, my next one? Yeah. yeah. We are going to go with Blazing Saddles. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, you know what? Let's uh, let's punt that. Let's punt that. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, punt. We'll save this for later. And for, I guess, my number eight, Beverly Hills Cop. Okay, respect. Go. Like, the only name I can really remember from this movie is Axel Foley, which is the main character. But the soundtrack is so unforgettable. Uh, uh, like, you, you, uh, I think it's, uh, I think Family Guy joked around with the soundtrack, but even with that joke, it's still a ridiculously good soundtrack. It sticks in your head in a good way, not a bad way. Uh, nice. And just just how smart the character of Axel Foley is that he keeps making these cops look like bumbling idiots and then wins them over and makes friends with them to the point that they have a sequel where we're like, let's team up this time. Uh, and this, this movie is very underrated uh, in my opinion. And it, it, it's, I love it. I don't know if I use the term underrated, but it's definitely not, it not, not talked about as much as, as it probably should be. It's <laughs> definitely one of the classics of the 80s. Like this is one of the 80s classics that I still genuinely love. Like, you know, of course, I've gone in I've gone on and on about, you know, oh, Back to the Future, Ghostbusters, I just don't get it anymore, but Beverly Hills Cop is one of the ones that I genuinely do still love. Also, highest grossing movie of 1984. Next film, please, sir. Kevin Smith's Dogma. <laughs> don't I don't call. I love it when religion gets um, a little bit of an ass whooping uh, in movies and this movie. And it's interesting, too, because Kevin Smith was raised Catholic. So he's like 
this is somewhat of an homage while taking the piss out of religion in the process. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, I like that they used uh, Alyssa Milano as God. Am I correct on that? Uh, Alanis Morissette. Right. Sorry. Wrong Wrong person with an A for their first name. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, Chris Rock as uh, the uh, 13th Apostle is also yep. uh, pretty cool. Um, um, Alan Rickman. One it's of his so best ro- one of his best roles to date. One of his best roles to date, yeah. and also and also the tragic story of Loki in this movie, played by Matt Damon. Uh, like how you originally see him as like the villain, and Ben Affleck uh, as Bartleby is the good angel, and then all of a sudden, when the simple conversation on on that train just tw- turns and twists the entire plot for the remainder of the movie. Uh, it, it's so interesting, and yeah, you know, this is definitely one of my favorite Kevin Smith movies, um, and I, I would definitely say this is a genuine favorite movie of mine as well. Awesome! All right, one more from you. All right, let's see here. I apologize if you think this should be higher, but I'm mostly putting it at this uh, at this number because it's been a long time since I've last seen it. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Punt. Punt. Okay, then. Legitimate punt. <laughs> All right. Case, start us off on your list, sir. Uh-oh. Case, we can't hear you. Oh, we, we lost Case's volume. Oh, no. Nope. There we I go. was muted. <laughs> I, was, I, was I was muted. That was my own so, fault. So, so basically, um, if he said anything during my movies, we did not hear it at all. No, I, I, by the way, I didn't say anything. I muted myself for a reason. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, we're definitely talking about Ian Jones and the Last Crusade in a little bit. Uh, yeah, for my first movie, I'm going to say something that Chris doesn't like as much. Chris just doesn't get. And it's pretty much like, uh, I have Casino Royale, he has Skyfall, and that's the movie for each other that... One loves and the other doesn't. Yeah, for me, it's Casino Royale, my absolute favorite Bond movie. Uh, I will never get tired of watching this movie. Um, as you can see, I'm a big Bond fan. Uh, I've always been a big Bond fan. I've seen all the movies several times. Um, they're, well, <laughs> uh, mo- most of them are very entertaining, very fun, and some of them are actually really well made, and I think Casino Royale is one of the best made at least in terms of action. Uh, one thing that Chris Duckman mentioned in his review that I always thought about, but never really, I could never really word it, every single action scene in this movie feels like it's an end battle, an end scene. It's like everything is put into it, and none of them overshadow another. All the action scenes are extremely good, uh, plus also the fact this is essentially a prequel to Bond. Uh, this is the first time that he actually becomes 007. Um, and then, well, we get what, in my opinion, is still the best Bond girl in Vesper Lynn, played perfectly by Eva Green. Um, and I, I can just watch this movie so many times, not get bored of it. Um, and I do think it's the best Bond movie. And that, believe me, uh, the Bond movies that I have, two, three, four, and five, are really close to this one, but yeah, uh, Casino Royale is like it was essentially, and what it wasn't really my introduction to Bond because I had seen some of the Brosnan ones, but it was really like what if you could say The Force Awakens, like it sparked, like oh, I love Bond now, I want to see the rest as well. Um, and that really made me a Bond fan, so oh, yeah, Casino Royale, first one, uh, uh-huh. then Inglorious Bastard. My favorite Tarantino film. Uh, by the way, uh, I do have to say uh, there might be a little bit of recency bias. I don't have a whole lot of older movies simply because I don't really like older movies. I prefer newer movies. They're faster paced. Um, and usually, well, in my, in my opinion, I enjoy them more and I can watch them more. Inglorious Bastards is by far my favorite Tarantino film. Um, it has, not by far, I shouldn't say that because Pulp Fiction is quite close, but uh, Inglorious Bastards is so much fun for me i can watch that movie any day all day it has some extremely iconic characters extremely iconic dialogue 
Um, and like, I don't care who you are, you will remember this movie. You will remember the characters, remember scenes, because especially already that uh, that opening scene is so in- iconic. Can I just uh, say, I knew this movie was going to be on your list. I'm just surprised you have it this low on the list. I actually have it lower on my actual top 50, but I, I did exclude a couple of movies for the sake of other movies on this list. Anyway, uh, next movie I have is Rush, um, 2013's Rush, directed by Ron Howard. Uh, look, I am a big Formula One fan, and I think this uh, movie perfectly portrays Formula One um, as we uh, well, as, as we see it in the movie, and portrays one of the best rivalries ever in Formula One history. And there have been a lot of good ones, actually. But yeah, Hunt Lauda in uh, 76 was... A huge one and uh i actually like after after watching the movie i went on wikipedia and i was like this is really how it happened yes it is really how it happened because it's sometimes very difficult to believe like you cannot really script some things in formula one this this season is one of those things where you can't script what happened but it happened and that's amazing um so yeah i think the movie is really well done and i i still cannot believe that daniel brew was nominated for the goddamn oscar he deserved that nomination at least <sighs> anyway uh seven my favorite comic book movie you can see it right here avengers infinity war uh yes it is very recent but it is by far my favorite comic book movie over the dark knight over deadpool over so many other comic book movies i the, the first time i watched it i thought it was so well done the more I watched it, I liked it even more and more. Um, every time I see it, it flies by for me. It feels like an hour and a half while I'm actually watching a two and a half hour movie. Um, and yeah, just the way it ends. It, it's truly the Empire Strikes Back. Maybe that's why I like it. Uh, from the Avengers movie. Um, and then... Uh, and then uh, next... Last one I'll talk about before we move on. Uh, Blade Runner 2049. Like, holy... Fucking shit, this movie is so goddamn brilliant. Uh, Denis Villeneuve is by far, uh, well, my favorite director working today and might actually be in the conversation of my favorite directors of all time. And that's because of stuff like Arrival. and Just all his movies, essentially, but Blade Runner 2049, it hit me so hard. And the more I see it, the more I'm just in awe how amazing it is. Um, Seriously, the cinematography, the visuals, the story, the way that it actually uh, made, uh, made sure that we had a successful sequel to Blade Runner. And initially, I was very hesitant about that because I was like, Blade Runner, really? You're going to make a sequel to that? And then you get this, and it's like, yeah, no, that's how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, it was brilliant. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Blade Runner 2049 has quickly become uh, one of my favorite movies. It, well, yeah. No, those are all very fair picks. Uh, for my number 10, I talk about this movie so goddamn much, and I don't give a shit. It's Mad Max Fury fucking Road. <laughs> to me, this movie is is the perfect way of combining great action set pieces with visual storytelling, with continuing a franchise, but also showing us how we can continue a fran- franchise but in a new direction. Because we could have just done another Max comes in, saves the day story, but no. We did a, we did this great story where we have two people who are genuinely good people, and they actually stand for something. I know, Keith, I know. But for me, this movie does, does it so perfectly. The score is perfect. The acting is perfect. The sandstorm sequence... Oh yeah, baby. All right, I know, I know. I've, 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 I've jerked this, uh, this movie off a lot, and I don't give a shit. Not as much as I've uh, jerked off this my number nine pick. Which little backstory here? I didn't discover this movie until 2017, but once I did, I could, I couldn't shut the fuck up about it, and I still can't because I love me some horror. The horror genre is one of my favorite genres in, in all, across all of cinema. Hell, I was just on Your List Sucks, where we talked about horror sequels. And the sequel to this movie is absolute shit, because this is one of the best horror movies ever made. 
And I'm, of course, talking about 2005's The Descent. In fact, Nico, I, I, I've pitched this movie to you. You really should watch it. it, it, it cause seriously, it's one of the goriest movies you'll ever see, but the effects are great. The acting, oh. great. The pacing, great. Sorry, go ahead, Case. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, f- finish your thought about the descent, okay. and I'll quickly want to say something. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, this, <laughs> this movie actually does scare me in several ways. And not on like a huh! jump scare kind of kind of mentality, but like unsettling. It, it's very unsettling, and it put because the way that Neil Marshall filmed it, it's so claustrophobic, at least for the first half. Because in the second half, it becomes a monster adventure film, and it's just a matter of are these women gonna get out alive? And you care about them. You want to see them get out alive. Are they all going to? Well, you know they're not, but. You want to see them succeed regardless, and it's oh, so good. So yes, sorry, Case. What is your quick thought? I'm I can't, I'm anxious. Uh, I I just wanted to say it is Friday the Thirteenth, and because of that, I rewatched the original Friday the Thirteenth, and I slightly hey. liked it the first time. It's <gasps> I I still I still don't really like it, but I, I I can see the appeal and I can I can respect what it did. Just wanted Progress. to say. <laughs> We are making progress. All right. Now, number eight for me. You know what? Fuck it. No, I'm going to swap it out with my other option here. <clears throat> Another movie that I actually haven't really jerked off that much. Yet. Yet. Give me time. I'm sure I'll get around to it. But because I was going to put The Dark Knight in the spot. I was going to put The Dark Knight in the spot, but... Fair enough. When when I've stopped to think about it, what's a comic book movie that has affected me more? And for the record, guys, I tried to actually be a little more varied. In case... I I know what you think I'm going to say. Oh, I might be pleasantly surprised with this one. Because, okay... Logan is one of the one of the greatest movies ever made, in my opinion. But it's not still not what was what wind up on the list. I'm gonna actually go with the recency bias here, and I'm sure I'll change my mind about this someday. But it's Avengers Endgame. Yay. Wait, now, now, Nico, is that a punt? Um, it is not, and I'll explain why. Uh, because I do have an MCU movie on my list, but I think I'm actually going to swap it out for something else because I it's I struggle to separate the MCU. I, I I view it more from like it's one gigantic universe, and it's hard to pick one child out of the entire family. So uh, so and for the record, that movie was Captain America: The Winter Soldier. But even then, I was struggling to really commit to an MCU movie. So. Uh, it's not That's... a punt. It's not a punt for me. I'm actually gonna okay. uh, take the MCU out of this list. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Let's talk about Endgame, though. But yes, let's. The, th- the thing with Endgame. Yes, you want to point out every flaw in the movie. By all means, go ahead. And for the most part, I'll actually agree with you on a lot of it. But <clears throat> for a franchise that, at first, I didn't necessarily care for. I only liked certain <laughs> movies, but. The fact that this movie came out and I, I cared so much about pretty much every character involved. And I gave that much of a shit. It, of course, it's a pass, The Dark Knight. And again, the reason I didn't put Logan on here is because I actually don't consider Logan a comic movie. I consider it a Western drama with comic book influence. <clears throat> Whereas if you ask me what's my favorite comic book movie, this is it. Yeah, this, you know, is it, truly, it, this is truly yeah. a comic book coming to life. Uh, yes. but, but, uh, and, like, I, I prefer Infinity War um, ever so slightly to Endgame, but in truth, it's uh, it's one movie. Infinity War and Endgame is one movie. It's just Avengers 3, huge-ass battle against Thanos, and it's fucking awesome. 
And all of it is awesome. And Endgame is awesome. And the payoff in Endgame is phenomenal. So yeah, what they did with that is unprecedented and is definitely something that, you know, should be considered for uh, best of all time stuff. Because it already is the highest grossing movie of all time. That it already has. <clears throat> Thank you. Nico, but get, but but join join the conversation for just two seconds on Endgame, please, real quick, real quick. So many things that reward you for all these years of watching the MCU movies. You get Captain America picking up Mjolnir finally after he came close in, in Age of Ultron. You get a tease of the fucking A-Force, the all-female Avengers team for a potential future movie. Uh, which, by the way, was She-Hulk coming into the picture very soon. She's Please. the leader of that. She, she's the leader of that team in the comics, so I'm excited for it. Um, you, you, you get the spotlight on Nebula, who really hasn't had that much spotlight thrown her way, and it, 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 this movie gives her sort of the title role in the same way that Age of Ultron gave Hawkeye the title role. Speaking of Hawkeye, you get him just losing his fucking mind because the one thing he cared about most in life got taken away from him in a literal snap. Uh, uh, and, he, and he's just spiraling out of control. Uh, you have uh, Black Widow trying to find her place in society, uh, or, or rather she did find it, and now she doesn't want to lose it. And it's with this Avengers family, but she's and she's willing to do whatever it takes to uh, to help her family accomplish their goal. You have Tony who lost everything. He lost his son in a way in, in Spider Man, and so like he's struggling to move on. And he he gets that family that he wanted uh, with Pepper, and it's just like his desire to do good in the world pulls him right back in, and he ends up sacrificing himself. Sorry, spoilers. Uh, and and then now this plot hole, how you want to feel about it is entirely don't up to you. But but we don't get care. we get Steve Rogers finally having that happy ending that we've been teased since 2011. It finally happened for him. I, and and I'm literally in tears the entire fucking time because that's Ser how it's seriously from, from the from the moment that you start to realize that. Uh, the, uh, that Tony snapping his fingers uh, will take his life up until the moment that the credits roll and the credits are rolling with the music that Captain America is dancing with Peggy. Like that entire time, I'm just crying. I'm just Damn. crying. It, it, it just kills me. And by the it, way, the ending, the, the ending after the ending, uh, like right after um, Steve gives Sam the shield, I mean, like you go through the credits and what do you hear? Ding. Ding, ding. The sound of Tony Stark literally building the MCU from the uh, from that first uh, movie, that's, that's Iron Man. True, that's true. I remember that. Yes. Oh, my God. <sighs> so great. Uh, but, yeah. Endgame. It's awesome. Watch it. Oh, wait. You all already did. <laughs> Several times. Several times. Uh, and then moving on to my number seven, uh... Again, movie that I adore. I adore this movie. Even though as a kid, I hate it. Because I wasn't a fan of musicals. I, I wasn't as a kid. But this movie, among others, convinced me to give it a shot and really give musicals their fair shake. And it's not only my favorite musical. It is my number seven as of right now. That is The Wizard of Oz. Ugh. Everything about this movie is so influential. It is so important to the history of cinema. Because just like Jaws after it and Star Wars after it, everything that could have gone wrong with this movie did. There's a munchkin hanging from a tree in the background as they skip across the yellow brick road. Literally. That is a real thing. Hell, you want, and you want to know what I want like most about this movie right now? I want a disaster artist style deep dive into how this movie got freaking made because the the stories that have been told about the making of this movie they're insane and I want them all honestly sometimes uh, the story about how a movie got made is even more interesting than the movie itself like yeah and and uh, like that like with the disaster artist and like with like I would want to see a movie about how Star Wars got made because so much went wrong with that move. Okay, 
S- stupid request, and I know you're going to groan when I say this, but if we get a movie about how The Wizard of Oz was made, can we get a sequel to that movie about how the Muppet version of The Wizard of Oz was made? No. <laughs> that version is awful, and shame on you, Nico. Uh... I mean, Miss Piggy gets water thrown on her, and she becomes skinny, and it's she becomes like this weird worm tube thing, and it's horrifying. Plus, Quentin Tarantino makes an unexplained cameo in the movie, so no. But he does? I completely yeah. missed that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So when, when Dorothy and the Wicked Witch are about to try their fight, their fight off, their standoff in the climax of the movie, Quentin Tarantino suddenly comes out and is like, and bam, both Dorothy and the witch, they bring out these katanas. And they fight with them. It's like, and then oh, I remember like, this. I remember this. Yeah, yeah. All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, and yes, Brian Fernandez. I do know about the Wizard of Oz with with Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. I'm not gonna do that though, because I love that album too much to uh, to do that weird mashup. But my number six uh, is the punt from earlier, Blazing Saddles. This is one of the funniest fucking movies ever made. And it's it's so relevant today. It's stupidly relevant. Because all it does is it slaps racism and, you know, fascists in the face. And I love it. I love it so much. Like, and of course, I, I do love westerns. I, I love the genre. But I also love, I love great comedy. I love great comedy that can stand the test of time. And in a strange way, Mel Brooks has this, this weird effect where... A lot of his old comedies have this ability to stand the test of time, whether it's through calling out racist establishments on their shit, like he does oh so brilliantly, or whether he just wants to make fun of a genre of film because he can. And he does oh so brilliantly. Nico, come join me for a moment. A horse gets punched in the face. And falls down in this movie. And for some reason, you can't help but laugh, even though we're witnessing animal cruelty happen before us. A uh, horse gets hung in this movie. Oh, shoot. That does happen. Yeah, I <laughs> I remember the horse getting punched, but not the horse getting lynched. Wow. Uh, uh, but, but also, you got to remember um, Richard Pryor uh, in this movie. He's literally <laughs> having... <laughs> He wrote it. He didn't star in it. That was Cleavon Little. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Sorry. Well, Cleavon Little, then, he's literally having a standoff with himself. Like, he's holding himself hostage to get the townsfolk to leave him be. And then he just th- yanks himself into the sheriff's office having a conversation um, with uh, with the inmates. Uh, and it's brilliant. It's so brilliant how, like... These people were about to lynch him, and then they're like, no, leave him go, leave him go. And, and, Won't and, somebody help that poor man? And the, the way this movie ends, with like them leaving the actual set of the movie and having a food fight in the cafeteria of the lot in which the picture is being made. Brilliant. So brilliant. Oh, and yep. there's, there's an orchestra in the middle of the desert, as, as as he's galloping for the sheriff job, as you're supposed to for some reason. Oh my god! Yes. All right. Okay. Nico, take us through your five through two. Okay. So again, five was originally going to be Captain America: The Winter Soldier, but uh. You've heard me talk about comic book movies a lot. I'm going to throw in a pick that I don't think either of you or anyone watching would have ever heard me say ever and probably hasn't appeared on anyone's movie favorite lists ever. Do you guys know of a movie starring Steve Carell, Channing Tatum, and Mark Ruffalo called Foxcatcher? Yeah. I hated that movie. It's terrible. I loved it. This is a movie I've only seen once in my entire life, but I have not forgotten a good portion of this movie because this is one of the first serious movies where there was no humor in it to balance it out that I ever saw. And it and it left a tr- and I don't want to say it was traumatic for me, but it was like it left a very lasting impact in in just like 
you you're witnessing uh, the struggle of these guys. Uh, like Mark Schultz, he's just trying to become somebody, uh, and, and he you just see him eating a bowl of cereal in his house, and it looks so sad. Uh, he's giving a pep talk to these kids at a high school, and uh, he's not really inspiring any motivation or inspiration in them whatsoever. Um, his brother David is the successful one, played by Mark Ruffalo, uh, and is Steve Carell. He's just trying to make his mom happy, all the and instead he just makes it all worse. Uh, he he pretty much just makes his mom walk out of the room in embarrassment of like this is what my son has spent all of my fortune on is a wrestling gym uh, um, for a sport I don't even like. Where are the horses? Because she is a she's a horse race fan. I think she breeds horses for races. Yes. Uh, and you, you just witness the struggle of all th- of well, not all three of these characters, but specifically more so Steve Carell's character and uh, Mark Schultz, played by Channing Tatum. Channing Tatum loses the Olympic trials, and he just bashes his head into a mirror. And he legit did that. Uh, uh, the, the, like, go watch a, one of the most recent Watch Mojo top tens, and it, it like that. That's a legitimate injury he suffered cutting his forehead open. Um, and then the one thing I did not see coming that has made this a movie that has lasted with me for a long time. Well, but but don't spoil it for those who haven't seen it yet in the chat. Never mind then. Never mind then. Thank you. But uh, and also there's a nice nod to the UFC towards the end of this movie. So it it, hel- it helps me relate a bit a little bit more. Fair enough. What you got next? Uh Lilo and Stitch. Now, this could honestly be more so because th- there are certain movies that Disney made TV series for and also straight to DVD sequels. So it become ah. it becomes part it becomes part of a universe that I just get myself sucked into. And Stitch we had basically every Stitch toy that there possibly could have been after this movie came out. We had Christmas ornaments. <laughs> we had McDonald's toys. Stitch was a household favorite of the Rigoli household. Uh, um, and, and so, like, th- this was the, this was. And I, I, I'm no offense to Lilo here. I feel like I'm leaving her out in the cold. Uh, but again, Stitch was just one of those characters that I really gravitated to. Uh, long before Toothless, and I think they're drawn by the same artist, uh, so that kind of helps too. Um, and it, the message of family of how you, uh, of how if you find people who love you, stick with them because they're worth keeping, uh, uh, and you don't leave them behind either. Uh, th- those are important messages. Which now that I think about, it, maybe I shouldn't uh, be giving my grandma the cold shoulder so much just because she's annoying. <laughs> uh, but this is one of those movies that you don't really talk about it enough, but it is uh, a, a very special gem in Disney's library. Fair enough. What you got next? Um, a Simple Favor, a very recent uh, release uh, as of this year. Um, came out, I believe, oh, it didn't, uh, I'm sorry. I keep thinking it came out this year. No, it, it, it just got snubbed at the Oscars, so. Ah, 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 well, um, I, I still remember, uh, that what sucked me in was the trailer. Like why, why is uh, Blake Lively wearing, uh, all these ridiculous pants suits and like you, from that moment on and, and you throw in the premise of like, Oh, she's missing now. Uh, and it, 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 I was just like, I want to see what this movie is. Uh, Cause uh, Paul Feig, you know him more so for his comedy. This was kind of his first venture into more serious content uh, or, or at least sort of a darker content. And it works. Cause I, I I really didn't know where this movie was going to go, and the longer it went in, the uh, the more uh, the main. I think the main thing I did know was she lived. She, uh, uh, but I didn't know like I, I that still didn't help me in like how this movie was going to end. And so when the way it did end, I was genuinely surprised by. And so this is a movie I constantly want to go back to, even if I don't, uh, because that's just me. I don't rewatch a lot of movies, but. I like it. I like it. 
All right. Uh, I believe you got one more, and then we'll throw it over to Case. The Princess Bride. And I think I've told this story a million times on D2A content, but I had not seen this movie for the longest freaking time. And I, a bunch of people just kept telling me, you need to see this. You need to see this. You need to see this. It's the greatest movie ever made. And I thought to my, and you know what? I case, I kind of thought to myself, they're overhyping it. It's going to fail to meet the expectations that these people have set for itself. And then I watched I, it. I, I, by the way, I want to say, uh, no one ever really hyped this movie very much for me. I only heard it, like, saw it pass by and I saw it and I think it's horribly dated and not that good that's it anyway anyway, they hyped it up so much that I thought there's no way it's going to meet the expectations they've set for it then I actually watch it and everything that the grandpa says to the grandson as he's hyping the story up to the grandson of like it's got this and it's got that and this and it's got this and it's got that it legit does as you watch the movie you see that it legitimately has everything that it's advertising in that introduction uh and uh, the dialogue the swagger of all the characters um like i i love the conversation that uh Inigo montoya has uh with wesley before they have that sword fight of how like they're just having a gentleman's conversation before they're about to attempt to kill each other. And they develop a mutual respect uh, with one another to the point that they're trying to help each other towards the end of the movie. Plus Andre, the giant, I don't know how much Andre, I can't remember how much Andre, the giant was physically hurting around the time this movie was made, but uh, uh, they used him to the fullest that they could. And it shows how much he had to offer to that movie, and it, and um, plus Wallace Shawn, like my God, I I still remember my introduction to him was the Cosby Show, and to see him in this movie where he gets to flex his comedy muscles a little bit more. I know, I know, Bill Cosby is a sensitive topic these days, um, but yeah, while everything in this movie is is just like a gem that makes you smile. All right. Case, now we go back over to you. Ah, please. Uh, yeah. Um, Nico, I, I will simply say I strongly disagree on some of your picks. I don't do top ten lists, okay? I, I, I don't like to do top ten lists. Fair you want, enough, fair you want some of my favorites? These are movies that I enjoy. Whether or not they're actually truly at, the, at my... No, 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 no. I, 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 get, I get it. It's just that some of these movies, I just wonder why you enjoy them, because I definitely didn't, but that's me. That's a difference in opinion. Um, I'll just go into the movies that I definitely enjoy and rewatch and like and stuff. Uh, Saving Private Ryan, Spielberg's best movie, the best war movie I've ever seen, and a movie that, yeah, uh, for some reason I'm able to rewatch a lot, because it is so well made. Uh, the characters are extremely good. Um, I don't know. It, it's just one of those movies that I just keep watching because I, I enjoy it. I enjoy watching it despite the gruesomeness of it because, yeah, it is gruesome as fuck. <laughs> that, uh, the next one. The funny thing is, this is my number four of my list and this is only my third favorite animated movie. And I, the thing is, I actually... I excluded a couple of animated movies that I had on my list simply because I was like, there is a lot of animated on my list. But you know what? I did, just got it. Because The Lion King is has always been one of my favorite movies. It is not the best Disney movie. I will instantly admit that. I know that people have issues with it. I get the issues. Um, not, not all of them. Some people just seem to complain. Uh, but yeah, I adore The Lion King uh, because... Well, I, I've talked about this on the Disney episode. Uh, it has a very personal connection uh, for me and my dad, uh, which, you know, that will always stick with me. Plus, 
I don't care what you say, despite all the issues that it might have, it still has some jaw-dropping stuff uh, that are some of the best in all of the Disney movies, um, regardless if you're biased towards it or not. Um, like the opening scene. Like, holy shit. <laughs> what a way to open a movie. Uh, then, what in my opinion is the all-time best action movie, Chris might disagree, I don't care, E2 Gentleman Day. It's not here. Damn it. I have a poster of it. And I well, it's it. in the thumbnail, so. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, it was in the thumbnail. T2 Judgment Day, a movie that Nico will never watch because of reasons. It's its own reasons. Um, but, uh, and I do want to quickly shout out the first Terminator. I think the first Terminator is extremely good and starts something off that the second only perfected, really. Uh, because uh, the only... The only thing that I will say uh, that the first one does better is the overall plot because T2 pretty much does, does the same plot, but it does everything else better. Like it, it does a formula that definitely worked in the first Terminator. It just does everything better because the first Terminator has some really dated effects, uh, like the stop motion on the Terminator. The moment that he cuts out his eye, it's dated. It's definitely around. That the is a reason why I will not watch that movie is the cutting of the eye for one thing. <laughs> That's rubber mask. You can clearly see it's a rubber mask. It almost looks like Michael Myers' ho Halloween mask. <laughs> uh, so, like, it, it doesn't look kind as of. good as <laughs> but, but everything in T2 looks phenomenal because it knew when to use CG. It was one of the first movies that really used CG to its full advantage. Uh, and so brilliantly that it's beautiful. Like, seriously, the, the scene where the T-1000 is, is, is on the floor and rises up is so jaw-dropping. Like, that, that scene alone will make... that You will remember that. And it's so goddamn iconic. And, um, yeah, it's just an extremely entertaining, good, well-made sci-fi movie where it, it's one of those things where I'm also really interested in the world that they created. Because as fictional as it is, it is kind of realistic. And there's a reason that Nico is scared of it, because, you know, theoretically, it could happen one day. And it is scary, but amazing at the same time. <laughs> anyway. And my number two, uh, how many times have I gone on the show saying how much I love South Park, and especially the movie? Uh, South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut is so goddamn brilliant. And it still holds up today, which is insane, because... The movie is about the MPAA being stupid. And the MPAA in 2019 is still as stupid as it was 20 years ago, as it was 40 years ago. The MPAA has always been stupid. And that's why this movie still holds up. And it's so brilliant. And there are so many good jokes. And also, the best thing probably about it is that Blame Canada was nominated for an Oscar. Seriously, if you listen to the lyrics of that song, you're like, that was nominated for an Oscar? <laughs> But that's amazing. I love it so much. So, uh, yeah. Uh, South Park, Big Alone, and Uncut. I have it at two. <laughs> and I don't blame you because, my God, it's one of the funniest anime movies ever made. It's one of the smartest anime movies ever made. And it's it's some of the best satire you will ever see. Period. Yeah. So, yeah. Here we go for my boring ass number five. Which I think now, if I'm if I'm if I'm understanding your li list correctly, case you're about to say punt. Probably. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Oh no, no, that's not on my list. But let's talk about it. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, yeah. This movie is unbelievable, and in my opinion, it's even better than Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is already a great film. I agree. Oh, yeah. But. And, and what's great about it is sim you just simply take the premise of what made Raiders great, and now we're just going to add a very heartfelt father-son story. Sean, Sean Connery, Connery is the perfect choice to play Henry Sr. He's the perfect choice. You couldn't do anyone else. And you have a, you have a great villain in the form of Walter Donovan and Elsa Schneider. Yeah, I know, I know. Spoilers, whatever. But this movie's been out for 30 years, oh, oh, people. You've oh, all oh. seen it by now. Also, she has the worst actual name, Allison Duty. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah uh, better, better, look, better look next time, there, sweetheart. But you know, and and to me, 
con- this is a hot take. This is a pure hot take. To me, this is Harrison Ford's best per- performance. Probably. Mm. Well, I, I look. Um, I think Indiana Jones is a better performed character than Han Solo, in my opinion. Because and, Indy Indy goes through more range than Han. Yeah, because Han is always Han, and he changes a little bit. He's a little flexible, but Indy definitely changes throughout the movie. Yeah, and also you got to think, um, George George Lucas has a more hands-on approach with Star Wars, and therefore that kind of limits the growth of his characters up until, as of recently, we're getting to see some of these characters get to be more rangy. Um, Whereas Indy, he's always gotten to grow with each movie. With the exception of maybe Temple of Doom, because technically that's a prequel. So it's like, yeah, grew, then went back. He started off somewhere, went back a little bit, then grows... uh, uh, well, in the third sure, one, because Indiana Jones at the very end of the Last Crusade is trying to reach for the grill, and then his dad says, "Let go," and he does let go. That's character arc. Yeah, and it, it's brought on by, honestly, is in my top five favorite moments in all of cinema, across thousands of movies that I've seen, and this movie has one of my top five favorite moments, and that is, of course, Indiana. Indiana, let it go. Because for the longest time, he kept calling him Hen- he kept calling him Junior, J- Junior, Junior, yeah. and and so like, what is like, Junior? And, That's and, insane. Henry Jones, Junior, Junior. <laughs> and by the way, I feel like Die Hard Five kind of ripped to this off a little bit in that. Uh, you think? <laughs> yeah, for 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 yeah, the long not because not for the sure. longest time in that movie, uh, the son does not want to call his dad dad he just keeps calling he keeps calling him jack and then finally he calls him dad by uh, the way that, uh, that's also a callback to die hard 4 when his daughter refuses to call him uh mclean and then or call herself mclean and at the end she does <laughs> yeah anyway that's a different story i forgot that part so yeah uh but it, it, it's so, it's so good that bad movies rip it off you know, and even even actually good movies rip it off, like uh, Aladdin and the King of Thieves. You know, they essentially they do the I same love story. that movie. I love that I, movie so I have much. A, I have a blast with that movie. It's honestly one of the best Disney sequels, period. But, Agreed. You know, and speaking of animated movies, uh, I had to get at least one to represent my love of animation, and what better way to do that than with than with <laughs> a movie that honestly kind of shaped some of my personal beliefs. Like this movie actually did something to help shape who is who I am as a person. So you guys know that I like to, you know, do my whole spiel about how like we, you know, balance. We should live a balanced lifestyle. You know, you should have a little bit of, you know, the right ideals in, in you as well as a little as well as a little bit of the left. You can't be too 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 much in one way or another because that's how we get imbalance and that's how we get destroyed. <coughs> Trump. Um but what I what I have to what I have to say, the movie that brought this on was Don Bluth's directorial debut from 1982 called *The Secret of Nim*. This movie is literally perfect for me. For you? For me. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Brisby is easily one of the great characters in all of fiction. She's just a, she's a single mo- she's a recently widowed mother who's just trying to look after her sick son and she will go above and beyond whatever it takes to save her son but also to get her family moved before the tractor plow comes to destroy their home. So what does she have to do? She has to reach out to these these highly intelligent rats who all that all that she knows about them is that her husband knew them. But she's not aware that these rats are hyper intelligent. She's not aware that her husband was one of was from the same men, you know mental hospital as them. Like all that we do is we just go on this journey with her, and she's such a great character. And the animation is, of course, honestly, it's better than anything Disney was putting out for years. By that point, 
honestly, Disney wouldn't get that good in the animation game, in my opinion, until until Beauty and the Beast. Like they're and Don Bluth nailed it. So, oh, to be, to be fair, Disney wasn't up to their um, like ninety standards up until The Little Mermaid. Really, everything like Disney was kind of struggling in. 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s with movies. Yeah. Pretty much. But yeah, that's that's why I just adore this movie and thank it so much because it did teach me a life lesson that I genuinely hold on to to this day. And that is the idea of balance. Moving on to my number three. Now, Case, uh, get ready to say I'm cheating, but I don't give a shit. It's a movie from 2001. A movie from 2002 and a movie from 2003. You want to take a wild guess what they are? Uh, are those the movies that I already talked about on our first favorite movies episode? You did, yes. But I'm I'm just gonna quickly mention it again because we also did an episode where we talked about the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Now yeah. I I incorporate them as one because that's how I watch them. I don't oh, that's watch really the good watching. Yeah. I watch them as a 12-hour film. And yes, <laughs> yes and, you, and thank you, not Case. Done. <laughs> yeah, after exactly. Silent Ship, you're not done. You need to see what happens next. And especially after Two Towers, you're not done. You need to see what happens next. You need to see how it ends in Return of the King. And, and, and Case, I can't thank you enough for giving me a copy of the Extended Editions. I seriously can't. You're welcome. Thank you. Because these movies... Just like Star Wars, you know, before them, they they changed my life in terms of what I wanted to, you know, in terms of how I wanted to look at this, the art of fantasy, in terms of how I wanted to look at uh, imagination and creativity. Because, shit, I bought the books because of these movies, and then I went back and read them. And I adore the books as well. I read The Hobbit because of them. I read The Silmarillion because of them. I play a lot of Lord of the Rings video games because of these movies. And it's the it's the best trilogy. It's the best modern day blockbuster trilogy of all time. The best Fight. movie trilogy of all time, as far as I'm concerned. And yes, better than Star Wars, the original trilogy. Yes. Because you can't really poke that many holes in these movies. <laughs> no. Plus, the, the, that, uh, the main reason I will always say that the Lord of the Rings trilogy is a better trilogy than Star Wars, Star Wars never intended to be a trilogy. Uh, Star Wars started off with a one-and-done film, Star Wars, and the way it ends, you know, it's pretty much one-and-done. There are a few things that you can, of course, continue with they did, but it's pretty much they end happy ending, cool, done. And Lord yeah. of the Rings... Uh, after Fellowship, they're not done. You know there is more to come, and that, that was always the intention. That's why, as a trilogy, they thought it out. They filmed it all in one uh, one take or well, one shooting. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so that was always the plan. And oh, they're so great! It's so good. All right, and now we're gonna get to my other cheat for my number two, which is. Yeah. I believe in America. America has made my fortune, and I've raised my daughter in the American fashion. Oh, my God. I'm the one author who can't refuse the Godfather. I, <laughs> I'm sorry. I have not seen a more compelling story about than okay, it's overrated. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. No, um, and it's just. I've never seen a more time accurate. I've never seen a more beautiful telling of how one man came to power. Fair, fair. And how one man fell from grace. Because when you first see Al Pacino, he's a good guy. He, and he genuinely loves his family, but he wants nothing to do with their business. But over the course of the first two films you see how he falls from grace so goddamn hard. Because he goes from the highest high to the lowest low when, it, when it's all said and done, and you are taken for the journey of a lifetime. Now, 
I can't officially count this as one movie because there is a seven-hour cut that combines both movies in chronological order. I just haven't seen it yet. So, you know, if anybody wants to do me a favor for Christmas this this year, I'll, I'll get it myself. Don't worry. Don't worry. Thank you, though. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, before we uh, officially hit our number ones, I do actually want to give a quick shout-out to some of the fans who were awesome enough to leave some of theirs, some of their favorite films, in the Facebook group. And just want to, you know, start with uh, our dear friend, the cool guy. Some of his favorites include uh, The Dark Knight, which I would have talked about Pulp Fiction. Uh, Dark Knight, Pulp Fiction are in my top 50. Awesome. Citizen Kane, definitely in my top 50. That's a good one. Uh, Whiplash, great film. That's great. Mm. Uh, Go to Brian Nussbaum, Mr. Hashtag China Six himself. Always happy to see you there. He also brought up Endgame. Yes. Yay. He, and for you, Casey, he brought up Lion King. Hell yeah. I'm big, longer, and uncut. Yay. And big, longer, and uncut. I definitely appreciated that. Who framed Roger Rabbit? I appreciate you for, mm. that, for that, sir, very much. Uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. That that was an honorable mention for me. That, that was, was definitely funny. an honorable mention. Uh, Malcolm Lay brought up Wizard of Oz as well. Thank you, sir. Lord of the Rings trilogy, as you should. Uh, mm-hmm. Avengers Endgame, awesome, good job. Hmm. Is movie forty three on that list? No, no, no. thank God. <laughs> um, and I don't believe I saw that many comments in the actual chat itself. Which you know what? Hey, no. that's fine. That's fine. Uh, okay, guys, let us know in the chat. What are some of your favorite movies? We might chat them out in a bit of time. <laughs> Hell yeah. But, uh, yeah, Nico. Favorite movie. Favorite movie. It's in the thumbnail. Talk about it. You guys know that the Cosmic Night Fury had to take a trip down to Burke for his number one. And it was just a matter of which one do I go with because I didn't want to cheat. Um, So I'm going with the one that I felt in my heart I kept wanting to go back to the most. And that's How to Train Your Dragon number two. Um, and I, I think it might be because I'm in that same stage in my life as Hiccup and Toothless are in, in that particular movie. Now, granted, I'm a lot older than they are, uh, at that point in time. Uh, but you know, the loss of a father, it's, it's still only been two, uh, like a year or so, uh, a little over a year, almost two, but is it's still fresh. It's still fresh. And so like the responsibilities of what to do. Um, and I, I, again, the lo- the loss of stoic happens halfway through the movie. Um, uh, but like it, it, the, one of the messages uh, of the movie that isn't really spoken of that much, but when you gain something new, something usually has to get pushed out. Uh, and that that's kind of what happens in the case of this movie in that Hiccup regains his mother and then right as he has the entire family back together, down goes the dad, uh, and so uh, and so the family has to huddle closer together to rebound, and that's essentially what's happened in this household. Is that we had we had to come together, we had to uh, in order to recover, and um, I had to take on certain responsibilities. Now that uh, I'm the man of the house, same as Hiccup, like he he's been put in this position now where he has to step up. He uh, he has to rise to the occasion, and he does that. His first opportunity at chief, uh, and he manages to break Toothless's mind control and, and uh, save Burke from getting wiped out by the Bewilder Beast, uh, and by Drago Bloodvist, uh, who has the weirdest name. Uh, like it's not Blood Fist, it's Blood Vist, and yet for some reason that's weirder to me. Um, <laughs> but but also this uh, in terms of like in terms of the the weird sport that's introduced in this movie uh, that kind of had the same appeal to me that pod racing did for the phantom menace, you get dragon racing uh, and, and it's a fun game. Uh, and I, I don't know why I love this line so much, but like when Stoke is cheering on Astrid of like, there goes my future daughter-in-law. I'm like, yay, they're, they're actually going places with this relationship. Now it, it's, it's just nice to see that kind of progression 
uh, with these characters, especially considering it, it, it's uh, we had only gotten through Riders of Burke and Defenders of Burke in terms of the cartoon series at the time. So, like, we had only covered two years after the first movie in terms of the TV series, and this movie takes place like five years after the first movie. Uh, uh, so, like, th there's still a lot of time that we haven't filled in, and they filled in th that time gap after this movie came out and right before uh, The Hidden World came out. Uh, but this this just feels right to me to go back to, this particular movie of the three. Because, like, from, from one, nobody's lying to their parents about what they're doing in their downtime. <laughs> that, that's one of my big pet peeves of the first movie, is that I, I don't... And granted, it, it, it's a crucial plot point, but I don't like that Hiccup had to hide things from his village. In this movie, he can be open and honest with everybody, and everybody respects him and the village for it. Um, and with, with number three, I feel like the emotional weight, uh, once you see it, like the first time you see it, it's going to make you cry your eyeballs out. But then I think I'm an only, I think in terms of me, I'm a one hitter crier. Like I, I, I'll cry for the first time and then it's hard for me to have that same emotional response the next time around. When I watch number two, I still feel the same excitement and joy and, and uh, tearing of my heartstrings in all the places the movie calls for it. Awesome. Um, in my case, it doesn't matter how much I watch The Last Jedi or Return of the Jedi, I will cry every single time. Same. Oh. Case, hit us with your number one. Well, Chris, I know that you also love this movie. Uh, and it's, uh, when I saw it in the theater, I didn't, like, I instantly loved this movie, but not as much as I do now, because over time I have realized how much this movie, um, was essentially a reflection of me, um, in a way. And that's Inside Out, my favorite Pixar mm -hmm. movie. Um, and the thing is, uh, when I first watched it, I loved it, but I was like, hmm, I think I need to see it again. And I saw it again and again and again and again. I've rewatched it a lot since. And the more I rewatched it, the more I realized I'm Riley. And just the way that everything was thought out, um, it is so brilliant how they wrote the screenplay. Everything that happens in this movie, everything that you see, um, like how their brain works, how her brain works, I was like, that's how it happens in my brain. Uh, everyone had it. Okay. Um, I, I think about everyone had an imaginary friend in at one point in their life. And I did as well. And you forget about that. And the moment that you realize that Bing Bong was that imaginary friend that you forgot about, I just fucking lose it. I just cry so hard because I'm like, no. It's so relatable. It is so insanely relatable that I, I cannot even describe how relatable for me that was. And uh, that, that moment every time makes me cry. And also such a phenomenal message for kids where sometimes it's okay to embrace sadness. You don't, you don't always have to block out sadness because it makes you feel bad. Sometimes it's good for you. Sometimes it helps you. And that is something that, yeah, a lot of people don't realize. Even adults don't realize that. And that's also the thing. This is this is not just a kid's movie. A lot of things in this movie will go over kids' heads and will impact adults. Like, it will hit you right in your heart. Like, oh, oh no! <laughs> and it's just so powerful and it's so brilliant. And I'm, I still absolutely hate the fact that this lost original screenplay. It should have won original screenplay over... What the hell just happened? Guys, can you hear, yeah, see me? Yeah. Hear me? Oh, there oh. we go. Okay, Skype, Skype was being weird for me. It, me me oh. too. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, uh, inside of me, the, the movie is perfect. Every time I watch it, it's, it's just so brilliant. <laughs> I just want to hit on what you said about... Uh, 
it's okay to feel sad sometimes. And no, I'm not quoting the fairly odd parents meme when I say that. <laughs> but um, we mentioned in the bonus episode from earlier this week, uh, during Mark Ellis's act, he had a joke about just having a good cry. And I think it, Inside Out is one of those movies that shows what you just said. It's okay to feel sad sometimes. Like, you, it, everyone needs a good cry every now and then. Like sometimes yeah. the way the world just feels like it's too much, and you need to let it out. Because if you bottle it in, it's gonna it's gonna destroy you from from the inside yeah. out. No pun intended there either. Um, and I, that's the appeal of this movie it, because a lot of kids don't really realize that, and like you said, a lot of adults don't really realize that either. Yep. Oh, and by the way, I do want to agree with you on How to Train Dragon 2. It is the best How to Train Dragon movie. And it was it was a damn good movie. I really enjoyed it. And one more thing I want to say about that. It, I, I love the character of Hiccup simply because, like, I, I, like, you see yourself in Riley. I see myself in Hiccup because yeah. Hiccup is always looking for n- new ways to do things that haven't been tried before. And, and I, I feel like that, that, that's something I've approached a lot since joining this community. It's like everyone has been able to get where they are just being good at knowing movies and movie trivia. I've had to find different ways to get noticed. And uh, so far I've had more hits than I've had misses. And it, I, I can honestly say Hiccup has been a big inspiration for that line of thinking. Awesome. So as we start to uh, wind this down, you know, yes, you can see I've got my guitar and I've actually plugged it in this time. Be 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 afraid. Be very afraid, everyone. Cuz yeah, I'm going to actually sing a little something because my number 1 uh inspired me to actually commit to music. And now I've been a musician since 2002. But of course, when I first started getting into playing drums, I hated it. I hated it immensely because I didn't want to practice every day. What the fuck was this shit? But then in 2003, I saw a movie directed by Richard Linklater. And one one of the songs that's in the movie goes a little something like this. Baby, we was making straight A's, but we were stuck in a dumb days. Oh, shit. I play, of course, playing the wrong damn chords. Great, because my guitar is still out of tune. I hate myself so much right now. I had this big speech planned and everything. <laughs> only me. This can only happen to me. There yeah. we go. We're having a live audio check. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Sorry, guys. Oh, and Danielle Joy is here for the for the Doman karaoke. Woo-hoo. <laughs> Baby, we was making straight A's. But we were stuck in a dumb days. Don't take much to memorize your lies. I feel like I've been hypnotized. And then that magic man had come to town. Woo wee, he done spun my head around. He sent recesses and sashes two and two make five. And now, baby, oh, I'm alive. No one can hear the guitar. Oh, of course they can't, even though I had everything tuned in and plugged turned up. Of course you can't hear it. God damn it. Whatever. School of Rock, motherfuckers. This movie literally changed my life. In. It taught me to actually take this thing seriously. It taught me that if I don't have a sort of creative outlet for myself, I will go insane. Because that is Jack Black's character. He literally cannot function without a creative outlet. And growing up, that was me. And I know it worked. That same thing worked for so many other people in there. And yeah, I know that there are people who 
are starting to see a little bit of a backlash this movie. And you know what? I get it. But you're wrong. You're Ted fucking wrong. You know, just like how people say, oh, there's a little bit, a little bit of backlash to, you know, uh, T2 and what I was like, no, just shut up because you're wrong. So this movie is... For me, it's funny, it's heartfelt, it teaches kids a great message, and it inspired me to quit being as much of a lazy bum as I was at the time, and to finally get back on the damn drum kit, and to pick up a guitar, and start start jamming, even though, uh, unfortunately, you guys couldn't quite hear me, which, god damn it, I seriously, like, yeah. I need, to, I need to work on that. Because, uh, guys, a little heads up. And Nico can attest to this. I did a little private test before we officially launched the channel. And I think just for the fuck of it, on um, maybe like a slow night for me, I might just pick up my guitar and pull uh, pull up Ben Bateman. You know, do do some random covers. And if you guys have requests, I'll learn, I'll, I'll learn a song. I'll learn a song and I'll sing it. On on the Facebook group. So, you guys tell me what you think about that. As guys, thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Who Cares Anyway podcast. We want to thank you all so goddamn much for a year of awesome content. We want to thank you guys for being with us on the Who Cares Any podcast, our Schmodown reactions, our Viva La Resistance, all of our regular reactions, and everything else that we have done and are going to do in the coming future, whether it's our Mandalorian recap, whether it's the finale of Resistance, whether it's whatever shows are going to come up. Because guess what? We can only grow from here. And we're going to grow. In fact, I've, I'm, I'm, worried, I'm thinking of some new ideas for next year now. And, Nico, I know you've got a couple ideas that maybe you want to put together in case. I want to put them together. I don't know if school will let me, but uh, I want to put them together. You know, I'm uh, I, have some, I have some ideas that I want to at one point also get to. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And without all of you, it's not possible. And definitely, Thrawn, let's collab on something. I would love that so goddamn much. So, guys, thanks again. In case, where may the good folks find you online? Well, if people want to know my actual top 50, that, by the way, that does change every few months because I keep figuring out where I have movies on my top 50. Um, but if you want to see my actual top 50 and other favorites lists, then check me out on Letterboxd. Simply my name, Case Quinevisa. Uh, and you can also uh, find me on Facebook, Case Quinevisa. And uh, at Dutch Movie Guy on Twitter for my Twitter stuff. And uh, I believe next week uh, going to have something also on the Who Cares Anyway podcast that's our favorite. You, you can tell us more about that. But I'm looking forward to that already. <laughs> All right. Nico, where can the good folks find you online? I'm not good at lists. I just gave you the movies uh, that I gave you because you. Re- I wanted to show that I have more movies in my back pocket than just comics and Star Wars. So I hope you enjoy the list I gave you as bumbling as my explanation of why I like them was. But you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube at Nico Suave or Goli, or just Nico Suave with four random meaningless numbers at the end on Discord, Instagram, Snapchat, and LinkedIn coming soon. Uh, I'm trying to get a job, man. Don't laugh. Uh, Combat Wrestling Trivia on Facebook, Combat Wrestling Network on YouTube. The poorly made Twitter handle is at Combat Wrestling, the number two. There is no letter G. Uh, right here on Dedicated to Art in all the places Case just said and Chris will say. And let's bring up those hashtags. China Sticks Army, D2 Anniversary, Trivia for Thon 2, Call to Action, we're kicking your ass. Um, Schmodown Orlando, I want that golden ticket. And 
Hashtag get Nico a give Nico a job. And of course, you guys can always find me on Twitter, Instagram, Stardust, Letterbox, and Discord at Skywalker Dome. And you guys can follow this favorite channel on Twitter and Instagram at D2A Channel. Please like our Facebook page and go join the Facebook group where we can uh, talk shit, we can talk shop, we can have fun, and yeah, I'll, I'll just randomly do covers. I already saw a guy request to do Comfortably Numb by Pink Floyd. Okay, I love that song, so I'll, I'll do it. And uh, yeah, next week on the Who Cares Anime Podcast, to continue the month of celebrating all that is D2A, we will be counting down our favorite characters. Oh yeah. Fictional characters. Favorite characters in all of fiction. For some of us, our our picks will be pretty predictable, but I think we're gonna have some uh, surprises that will come come your way. But until, oh, I, I, oops. I do want yeah. to say one more thing. That is Chris and I, uh, Chris and mine favorite movie of all time. We're gonna talk about it, but that's it. Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, bar none, bar none. So yeah, guys, until next week, you know what to do. Take care. Yeah.